For those of, of uh, you who don't know me, I'm Irvin Lipman. I'm the director of the yes. Oak Museum of Art. I'm delighted uh, that you could join us today for this conversation with uh, writer and artist uh, Paul Gervais. Uh, we've just opened an exhibition of Paul's work, uh, Faces and Forms, in our second floor gallery. Uh, the exhibition is part of a curatorial series uh, focusing on South Florida artists that is supported by our Collectors Forum donors. And we thank them for this important contribution of bringing a focus on talented artists uh, uh, in our neighborhood like Paul Gervais. Uh, but before Paul joins us for this conversation, um, Tatiana, why don't we show this short video uh, that was taken in his studio. When I first took this studio space, it was kind of a rough, neighborhood. It was just me and three drunks around the corner. And now it's uh, yoga pants and coffee cups. I guess you could say it's gentrified. There's a cafe, a food hall just down the road. And suddenly that's changed everything. And that's fine. But the truth is, when I walk through my door and I'm here in this space, I'm not in any place. I don't think about geographically where I am. I like to make my own frames for these works. I don't particularly like a mass-produced frame or a frame shop frame. I find that there's a coldness to that. These are a bit wonky. You make them by myself and I spill a little glue here and there. The corners don't come together perfectly. The wood is totally unfinished and yellow. There's a kind of built-in patina to it. I think that that's the right framing solution for paintings like this that so clearly show the hand of the artist who made them. I'm totally alone here, and I do everything myself. I stretch my own canvas. I prime the canvas myself. I gesso, I sand. Nothing about it is perfect. I think you can see that it isn't something you just go and buy. And the preparation of the surface for paintings, such as these oils that I'm doing now, is really interesting because there are many ways to prepare a surface. You can simply paint on the primed canvas the way it comes out of the row. And that's fine, and you get the color of oh, this linen, for example, that I'm using, this beautiful beige gray. And this can come through, and it's interesting to me to work with that.
but that gives you a uh, puts Paul in situ in his studio. But let me give you a little background information uh, before we bring him live uh, to our screen. He attended uh, St. Michael's College in Vermont, where he earned a, a BA in English Literature in 1969. He also attended San Francisco State University, where he studied poetry. And in 1980, he earned his uh, Master of Fine Arts from the San Francisco Art Institute. Uh, he's worked in advertising and real estate before becoming a full-time writer and artist. He met his husband, Gil Cohen, in 1974, and together they have lived in Boston, and San Francisco, New York City, and Lucca, Italy. Uh, Paul's first novel, Extraordinary People, was published in 1991 and was a finalist for the Penn Faulkner Award for Fiction. Uh, their home in Lucca, a Villa Massé, uh, which they bought in 1981, was a subject of Paul's book, A Garden in Lucca, uh, which was published in 2000. It's a personal memoir recalling the author's journey of self-discovery, creating this extensive and extraordinary Tuscan garden. And we'll talk more about gardens, I'm sure, uh, very shortly. Uh, Paul and Gil currently divide their time between London and West Palm Beach, uh, where Paul maintains the studio you just saw in this introductory video. He joins us right now from his home in West Palm Beach. Um, and uh, we do want to make this a conversation. So uh, you know, just look at your Q&A or chat features at the bottom of your screen to submit your questions. And now my pleasure to welcome uh, Paul Gervais. Paul. Hello, good morning. Uh, yeah, the film that you just watched is made by someone named Michael Joseph who uh, is in his early 20s and a student at the San Francisco, at the um, uh, Dreyfus School of the Arts. And um, it's, uh, it's beautifully done, but he's the subject of one of the portraits that I've done in the current show at the Boca Museum. So I wanna mention that while we're thinking about the video we just saw. But in the meantime, thank you, Irvin uh, Lippmann so much for this opportunity and I'm very, very excited and happy uh, with the show. And um, I think it's what you do where you consider artists who live in the sphere geographically of, of your museum and that you give opportunity to artists who are not necessarily from the big hot spots of uh, art centers of New York City or Los Angeles or uh, Dusseldorf. But actually you do find talent and artists who are uh, local and you actually offer them these opportunities. And so I, I thank you very much for doing that. And I also want to thank um, Kathleen Goncharov, who is the curator uh, for this show and uh, she worked very hard and, and produced a, a terrific result. And I'm very pleased with it. I think I'm looking at, yeah, I think I'm looking at an installation shot now. Am I, should I talk about this? Um, I, I think so, okay. Yeah, please. Somehow things, are, it's kind of big black for me except for these images, but uh, we can start with this one. Yeah, there are 33 pieces in the show. And as you can see, these are very different from the things that you saw in my studio because I'm constantly changing. And um, these works all happened within the past year. This is a portrait of Gil Cohen, my partner, and um, that I painted this summer in London. I don't keep a real studio in London, but I'm able to work. And um, this is oil on linen. And those are glasses that I just that, that he bought in the 1960s in San Francisco, and he's still from time to time. Uh, whereas them, he's very fond of them. I'm not sure I like them very much, but uh, sometimes I catch him in them and I decided to uh, take a, por a photograph of him and I did this, um, this painting. 
This is um, my cousin via marriage, uh, Alex Graves. And it's a woman with a tattooed hand, but in truth, she's tattooed pretty much everywhere. And she was up until very recently, I think in the pandemic, um, the director of digital for Condé Nast. And someone was looking at this recently and said, well, my father always told me that if you have a tattoo, you'll never get an interesting job. But she managed to. This is my nephew, great nephew, Eli Patterson. And I like doing children, though I often find them kind of difficult. There's something about the smoothness of their faces that it's quite a challenge. When you paint an older person, there are so many different facets to the face. And um, it, it makes it more, it makes it easier to paint them really, which in many ways is why Rembrandt painted older people. There's much more possibility for a painter in painting the older face. This is my cousin, and she lives in Oman. Uh, she sort of shares with me a great love of traveling the world and living in exotic places. And she's been there for several years now with her Italian boyfriend. I think they're still together. And I call that, yeah, woman with red glasses, Trisha Herpy. This is, I'm not going to say it properly, but it's Zhu Tangyi, Tingyi, yeah. And he is an artist in London. And I saw his work at a show at the Saatchi Gallery in Duke of York Square, which was a show of recent graduates of the important London art schools. And he showed one photograph. He's not a photographer, he's a conceptual artist, but I very much liked this photograph and I bought it. And so they put me in touch with him and uh, it was arranged that he would come to my apartment in London and deliver it. And he did. And when he came, this is the way he was dressed. And there were a few other people there, so it was all quite uh, convivial. And after a while, I, I couldn't stop looking at the outfit and everything. I said, do you mind if I take a photograph of you so that I can do a portrait? And he was actually quite happy with the idea. I was worried that he wouldn't be. And I did, I took the picture and I painted the painting when I got back to Palm Beach in October. So this is one of the we might call them abstract works. Uh, they resemble still lifes, but I don't think of them as still lifes, and I, I think they are not still lifes. A still life is something that you do for, with using real objects that you own as a model. In other words, your kitchen uh, jars and bottles and what have you, or fruit uh, that you put out on a table in your studio, and then you paint from life that way. These objects are fully imagined. They don't exist. They are not in my possession. They are only in my imagination. And I arrange them in my imagination. I work it out in a sketch, and then I paint it. So I suppose it's time to talk about the origins of this. And I did works like this for about two years. And my intention with it was to, can we go back? My intention was to um, do oil paintings that were uh, as simple as they could possibly be while seeming vaguely representational. In other words, I wanted light, shadow, I wanted an illusion of perhaps a table and a sky as in a still life. And I came up with, with this idea 
So they are obviously, if you know the work of Giorgio Morandi, they certainly are inspired by that because I've always felt whenever I'd been in the, pro in the presence of a work by Morandi, that they spoke to me in a very deep way and uh, stayed with me long after I saw them. And whenever I'm reminded of those first experiences of seeing Morandi's, um, I, I remember the, uh, the depth that, that they've achieved in my effect. So I began to do these works with the memory of Morandi, but with what I just described as a direction. Okay. Back to portraits. This is a friend of mine in London <clears throat> who's an art student. And most of my friends are obviously in the arts. And uh, he's now a student at the Corto studying art history, which is, of course, the premier place to, to study art in London and, and in the world. And um, I, I used a photograph that he'd sent me to do this portrait. And I didn't know until afterwards that the story behind it, which was he sings in a choir. And this was taken at a choir practice where he was not at all happy with his performance. And he walked out onto the balcony and he was quite upset with himself and a friend took that picture. And so that's where the image comes from. And this is the painting I made. Okay. Yeah. This is another great nephew. And it's the same one as the boy in the red shirt back there. Um, boy with a handful of stones. This is taken from a picture of him uh, on a beach in which he's playing with the beach stones. And his name is um, Eli. Uh, this is a, a, a young woman I've known since she was uh, in her early teens from Lucca, Italy, where, of course, I lived for 35 years. And um, I'm fascinated by her look. She's a really good friend of mine, and she sends me photographs, and I've painted her about five times. There's something about her face that lends itself very well to the kind of painting, portrait painting, that I do. And it's her, her features are extremely chiseled and defined. And, um, and I like that. She's a beautiful young woman. This is me. Uh, so this is inspired by uh, Lucian Freud, who used to take do self-portraits using a mirror, which he placed on the floor by his easel, so that the image of himself that he got was actually with a lot of chin and looking up at him. And I thought that was a very intriguing angle. And um, so I took a few pictures of myself that way. I've done two of these paintings. And this is one of them. Of this series, this is the very first painting I did. And um, I took a picture of Gil before breakfast one morning. So it's called Man After Breakfast. No, it's supposed to be Man Before Breakfast. Don't know how that happened. It's Man, man Before Breakfast. Could be my error. But um, yeah. Uh, and I was quite surprised with how well it came out, if I do say so myself, even though it was the very first one. And I was so happy with it that I just kept on going and I'm still doing it. This was very late in this series of my objects imagined, where I actually looked back at the work of Giorgio Morandi to think about some of the colors in his palette. And though these are much brighter and more alive than the colors he used, uh, there is a reflection of, it's, it's a bit of an, uh, a homage to Mor Morandi more than the other paintings would be. 
Mumbi O'Brien is an artist who is from South Florida. And she worked for the Gavlak Gallery in Palm Beach, where I had my first shows when I began to spend summers here beginning in 1914, uh, 2014. And uh, I've kept up my friendship with her over the years. She's a very beautiful woman. And this is a portrait of Mumbi. Once again, my friend Vittoria from Luca. And you can see that I enjoy painting her. She loves to dress up and she's very into style and glamour. And I don't mind that at all, quite like that. This is a student at the Dreyfus School where Gil Cohen, my partner, is on the board and is a mentor. And this student is in fact one of Gil's mentees. He's a dancer, Robert Beck. Once again, Eli, the, the great nephew, uh, taken in London, his grandparents are British. And so he's, they come to England quite a, quite a lot and uh, bought these souvenirs and he, there's Eli in his Sherlock outfit. This is part of a two panel piece. And in the show, it's shown as two panels Two works side by side. Uh, one is called Eight Figures, One Red. The other is Seven Figures, One Red, I believe, something like that. Uh, it's also very late, and it's oil on linen overboard. Usually, I've painted on stretched linen. But towards the end of this series, I found that I would like to try to paint on board with the harder surface and see what I came up with. And I, I did several of them and they ended up in these artists' frames that I made. I talked about that in my video. Richard Wilson is a very famous actor in the UK. He had a series on television called One Foot in the Grave and it ran for more than 10 years and it's a very, very funny comedy series. If you haven't ever seen it, you can stream it and get it from uh, those sources where you watch all of the old classic British comedy television series. Well worthwhile. It's definitely one of the funniest series ever done. And he's very, very famous there. Now 84, but when you go out to dinner with him, people come to the table constantly and they want photographs. They stop him on the street. So it's kind of amusing to go around with him. And um, yeah, he's, a, he's a, an iconic comedy star of England. And I didn't say that I've known him for 40 years. I should throw that in. He's one of my best friends. On the other hand, this, this is a young man who I first met when I pushed him around Soho in New York in a stroller. Uh, when he was smaller than a toddler because he's the son of friends. And I've kept up with him and he lives now in Los Angeles. And he sent me this picture. He wanted a portrait and asked me if I would do it. And I did it. And so that's Vincent Perini. Missy Smith also lives in Los Angeles. And she's the boyfriend of a friend of mine from Luca, uh, who, whose family I've known for three generations. And Missy, they're very happy together. They have common interests. They both skydive and they post the videos and it's terrifying. And she is the daughter of Bruton Smith, who owns most of the California venues of NASCAR. This is the same young man who uh, was shown after choir practice before with the hair catching the light. And uh, here he is with a croissant. Another great nephew, Philip Patterson. Um, this taken, I think, as he watched a baseball game 
um, of his friends. And you can see that he looks like he's ready to be a coach. Yeah, this I called enfilade. Um, and I, I, we've thrown up a, um, a definition there. It is not sense one. It is sense two, which is a series of rooms that are linked usually by doorways that more or less connect one after the other. So that if you stand at the far end of one room and look down, you see a series of rooms. So that's why I called it that. This is a slightly different series in which I've taken those imagined sculptural forms that I was using in the still life seeming pieces. And I've installed them in spaces that are minimalist contemporary space, something like contemporary art galleries. And in doing that, I've even hung in their company some paintings that I uh, th that are reflections or references to or homages to the work of abstract expressionists from the 1950s. <clears throat> Eli again in a beanie. This is my neighbor up the road here in West Palm Beach, and she's from Barbados. And she asked me if I would do her portrait. This is one of my favorite portraits of Gill. And um, on the right, you see a sculpture by Michael Dean, uh, which we uh, have in our collection. And he's wearing a Tyrolean jacket from Salzburg. We occasionally go to Salzburg for the music and for walking in the Alps. And I very much love the mountains of Austria. And uh, yeah, this is a, a serious look at Gill. Some mutual friends have come to me and said, oh, but that's not the Gill. I know, Gill is a smiling animated person, but I usually say to them, but do you live with him? Another closer to Morandi piece from the late part of my series where I've picked up on some of his russet colors that I like. My Second cousin, no, no, wait a minute. My first cousin twice removed. That's the way it goes. Luke, L-U-C. Um, my cousin, Emily Boyd, my mother was Boyd, um, married uh, an Italian-American, Belluzzi. And they named this boy Luke Belluzzi. Luke, because Gil and I used to live in Luca, which is spelled with two C's. But anyway, the reference and connection is that. Marco Estrella is a former student at the Dreyfus School, where I first met him. And he's now a student at the London School of Economics. Very, very brilliant boy who uh, at the age of, I think he might have been 19, was the youngest paid employee at the main gallery of Gagosian on Madison Avenue in New York. So he's, he connects himself well to the art world, very, very involved in the art world now, dreams of starting his own art gallery. But he's still very young and he's still in, 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 in college, we'll see what in the university, we'll see what the future holds for him. I think it's gonna be interesting. Michael did the video that we watched at the beginning, Michael Joseph. Okay. Ah. So there's me with um, Michael Joseph at the opening of the Boca show. Thank you, Paul. Hmm. That pretty much covered the whole thing, didn't it? I know. No, that was very good. I was good. So I think we have uh, 
some questions. Um, I did, probably the, the first one I see here is that uh, um, you mentioned taking photographs of, of uh, your subjects. Is, is that how you work exclusively uh, in capturing your uh, subjects? I work exclusively from photographs. Uh, and I, I don't think that people are so anxious to sit down for six or eight hours and pose in an art studio anymore. I know that was a time, there was a time when that was pretty much the only way you could do it. But those days are gone. And um, so I think for the most part, pretty much any of the artists who are doing this kind of thing nowadays do not use live models. And I, I would name people like Elizabeth Payton, who works pretty much exclusively, if not exclusively from photographs, as do um, Amy Sherald and uh, uh, Kahindi Wiley and Lynette uh, Boki, um, these portrait painters who are now really at the front of the uh, uh, of everyone's mind in the art world. So yeah, I prefer to take the picture myself of the subject because I'm looking for deep shadows and contrasts and I'm looking for people to look a bit um, off guard because I find that that gives you a way in to deeper issues for them. If you've got a smile on your face, it tends to look like a superficial photograph. And that's not what art is to me. So you mentioned Freud, you want to, uh, that is uh, the artist. Uh, did you want to say a little bit more about your uh, fascination with him as a portrait painter? Yes, um, I went to, I've always liked Freud, uh, but I went to uh, a show of his self-portraits at the, um, I think it was at the Royal Academy in London last year. And it was just his self-portraits. And it was a, a wonderful show. He's an extraordinary artist. And I was especially taken with two or three of them that were about in inches, I would say eight by 11 or even seven by 10. So very, very tiny paintings of, uh, in, in one case, a neighbor of his who lived just down the road, a young boy, uh, and another, his one of his daughters, um, where the, the face is even, you don't see the top of the head, it's cropped quite closely. And I found those to be the most intriguing of his works. And that stayed in my mind. And when I read a recent biography after that of him, I think it's sitting here, and it's called The Lives of Lucian Freud, and it's by William, William Femer. It's a two volume work and each volume is 600 pages. So you need a bit of time to get to these. Uh, I read the whole thing. And um, after reading the first volume is when I, one morning, went to the kitchen to find Gill before breakfast. And I took the picture and painted the painting. So it was the idea of Lucian Freud and his body of work as being autobiography that really intrigued me. And I, I, I don't have that in my, did not have that in my own work. Uh, most artists don't. But when you look through his works, um, what you really see is an account of British art history from the mid 20th century, because so many of his friends were important and famous artists, whether it was Francis Bacon or Frank Auerbach um, and, and many, many others. Uh, so all of that lent a certain richness to his um, his work that I found very intriguing. And my portrait series has kept this in mind and in inspiration. I hadn't really thought before, but uh, I guess your works are autobiographical. These are all people you know they, and of yourself. They are now, yes. With it, 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 I suppose it is. It, it definitely is. I don't paint people I don't know. Um, I have on a couple of occasions painted, like you saw the, the painting of young Luke, um, um, my cousin who's a baby. I've never met Luke, but he is my cousin. So that's okay. Um, he's there. Uh, I can do that. Uh, he's another chapter in your life. Yeah. He's in my life. 
so, so but I, you have, and so okay. oh, good, Tammy has a question. Please. I have a question, Paul. When we did the rehearsal, there was a painting behind you which yes. uh, was not in your presentation. And um, of course you, you moved to another room. Wonder if you could talk about that piece. Yeah, I knew you were gonna say that, of course, <laughs> aren't I? But um, I don't know if anyone recognizes that person. Now, this is not an exception to uh, painting people I don't know. I do know him and um, I modestly say, so it's okay, and I very much admire him, and I've spent time with him. Um, and there's a whole story that goes with it. I suppose now's the time to tell it, is that right? Uh, uh, yeah, uh, I, when we had our garden in Lucca, Italy, um, and it was quite a well-known garden, and I published the book, A Garden in Lucca, which was um, published all over and in several languages. And, um, I had been seeing, I had seen his book about his garden at High Grove, and I really wanted to go and see it. So I took one of my books and I put it in a package and I sent it to him saying, I know that you love Italian gardens, which is true, and he comes to Italy a lot. Um, I hope you might enjoy this. So I thought that he would probably, uh, there's the book cover. I thought that he would probably have an assistant to an assistant to an assistant write to me and say, maybe you would like to join a group to visit my garden at Highgrove someday, something to that effect. Well, no, that isn't what happened. He wrote back to me personally. Uh, I'm very delighted to have the book and enjoyed it. And um, in his own handwriting, asking me to go and have tea with him at Highgrove um, in the, at the end of June. So obviously I said, yes, dropped everything, not that there was that much. And Gil and I went and we stayed in Tetbury at the little hotel just down the road from Highgrove. And um, we were driving the cheapest car I could rent, which was a Skoda. Uh, I guess they're not so known in the United States, but it's kind of an East European crazy car that um, it, it certainly does not have any class to it. And uh, parked it under a tree at the hotel. And I didn't realize that the tree was where the birds, flocks of birds um, spent the night. So when I got up in the morning, the car was absolutely covered with bird droppings. And we were about to drive to Highgrove to, for tea. So never mind, we did. And it was also during uh, hoof and mouth disease. So we had to stop at the first group of bobbies as you enter the property and they sprayed the wheels and, um, and then we had to drive along further. And there was another group of bobbies and they looked in and made sure and it was us. And then we, uh, we were saying, well, where do we go? And they, we'll just drive up right to the main door of the house and the prince will meet you there. And so we did. And he was standing on the front steps. And um, the whole thing was just for Gil and me. And it was just he. And there was a butler we saw for a moment. But um, we spent two and a half hours with him. He served tea to us, poured it himself on the terrace in the back, and then personally led us around the garden. And it was a great experience. He's a very nice man, I have to say, and I, I really feel that just in that, uh, I got to know him very, very well. And in fact, um, we have a regular communication. I exchange letters with him at least once a year. He always writes to me very personally and signs it yours ever. And if he has a new publication or a book, he sends it to me. So I would say I know him. Uh, I'm not an intimate friend but um, he's, he's there. <laughs> yeah. Could you tell us a little more about the garden? Yeah, it, it, um, the, the estate that we bought, this is on the left is, is an, a book in Italian uh, about the garden. And that's the front, you're looking at the villa um, and you're looking at the front garden. 
Now, this was a 60-acre estate um, from the Renaissance, mostly the 16th century, sort of late Renaissance. And these are two shots of two different bits of the garden. Um, it had many, many different rooms and many parts. And it's been published in all of the most important garden magazines everywhere, including in very unexpected places like Croatia and uh, East European countries. You wouldn't have expected them to have garden magazines, but they do. And we had um, about a 1,000 people a year. It was not open to the public. But with groups from botanical gardens, from garden clubs all over the world, from interested parties who would come in groups always. Um, yeah, by the end of a season, it would have been about a thousand people who, who would have seen it. And sometimes I took them around personally, sometimes Gil did, sometimes the head gardener did. And it was very much on the circuit of uh, gardens to visit in Italy by these passionate garden. You don't, we don't all know that there is a culture of people who basically do only one kind of travel, and that is visit gardens. And they'll do it anywhere in the world. And they'll, they'll see four or five gardens like this in a day for five days, going around in a bus and being lectured to about them. So uh, they, they came, and um, it was nice to have them met a lot of great people that way. But we sold the house and the garden in 2016, I think it was, and on to other things. Is it still open? Does the new owner? No, they do not open it. They no. don't. What no. a shame. It looks beautiful. It, it is. Yeah, right. it is, I have to say. I modestly say it. So. Mm -hmm. It's well, some of the shapes of the uh, um, of your uh, of the, the plantings uh, seem to be reminiscent of your uh, what you call abstracts. Well, I, I think you know when you're an artist and you you work in different disciplines because I I'm a visual I'm a painter I'm a writer I've been a gardener. Um, it's all coming from the same creative source. Yeah. So there is a question from Patricia Cohen. Uh, she says, what inspires you most right now in your painting? Um, well, as inspiration goes, um, I think I have to say that I've always been most inspired. This sounds narcissistic and I don't, and it isn't by my own work. And um, I look back at the work I've done in the past how well I think I've achieved it, how I painted this, how I painted that. And I'm always looking at that from ins uh, inspiration, hoping to, to improve or to learn more about myself uh, as an artist. So that's, that's my inspiration, my past errors, my past failures. I have another question from Stephanie who lost power. She's been having trouble with her internet, but she would love to get um, a copy of your book. And she asked about whether it's available in English. Uh, a Garden in Luca is yeah. available in English. Yes, that's the, that's the one. Uh, I had it ready just in case she asked me that. Uh, <laughs> yes, this, this is available on Amazon. It's totally in English. It's a whole book. There, oh, are, no, okay. there are no illustrations in this, so it's it's a memoir. Okay, you know she said it's not on Amazon. Oh yes, so it is. It is okay. It is. We'll, we'll have to look further. The garden in Luca. Uh huh. <laughs> <laughs> we we had somebody else who suggested maybe we could have some autographed copies at our museum store. Um, of that. Yeah. That's possible. Well, you know, it's, it, it, this was published in, in uh, 2000, so it's out of print. But when you go to Amazon, you get it through second market sellers, uh -huh. okay. and they, they list them for you. You can buy new copies, but then it's going to be $135 or uh, something like that, because they're sort of collector's items. But you can buy used um, uh, red books for 10 or 15 or something like that. Mm -hmm. But they're not going to be new. <laughs> but you can still have them autographed. Uh, yes. 
unless they're already <laughs> autographed to some of my best friends. Oh. <laughs> I don't want to sell them, <laughs> which does happen. <laughs> Good. So somebody else was asking about your novel. Um, yeah, my novel is um, Extraordinary People. And this was published in 1990 by Harper Collins. Uh -huh. This is available too on, on Amazon. It has me on the back. <laughs> That's a great photograph. Oh, yeah, younger. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Well, thank you so much, Paul. And Tammy, did you want to have some? Yes. Um, thank you so much, Paul. This was just so wonderful. And thank you, everybody, for joining us today. Since we're working on the renovation of our own museum sculpture garden, we're continuing with the theme on gardens, art, and landscape for our March Collectors Forum programs. So we had a little teaser today with um, Paul's beautiful garden in Luca. On Monday, March 15th at 11 a.m., again, we'll hear from Amy Kupek larue one of Europe's foremost garden guides, who will be speaking to us from a historic viewpoint about Italian Renaissance and Baroque gardens, including Villa d'Este, Villa Lante, the Boboli Gardens, and Bomarzo. On Tuesday, March 16th, the following day at 11 a.m., We'll hear from Riva Blumenfeld, fast forwarding to um, the 20th and 21st century, talking about artists who pioneered land art in New York and around the country, uh, around the world actually, from the 1960s, including installations by Claus Oldenburg, Richard Long, Robert Smithson, Christo and John Claude, James Terrell, and Maya Lin, among others. Um, these should be very special programs, so I hope um, you don't miss them. Look forward to seeing you then. So, thank you, Tammy, uh, and thank you again, Paul. I, I, I would be remiss if I didn't also thank Paul for so graciously uh, sharing um, not only the exhibition here, but also uh, he has generously uh, participated in our irresistible urge to create fundraiser. Uh, and his contribution is truly extraordinary. So for donors uh, at the $25,000 level, he has offered to paint a portrait of the person of, uh, of their choice. Uh, we replaced uh, our gala this year, as most of you know, uh, with this uh, fundraiser of irresistible gifts. And I've been asked uh, by our development folks to remind you that our limited edition of irresist irresistible gift boxes with works by Jose Alvarez and Vicky Pierre and John Boone are still available uh, for a contribution of $1,000. Uh, so, uh, and, oh, and also I've been told there are only nine left. So uh, uh, I feel a little like QVC here, uh, but thanks again to Paul Gervais and, and to all of you uh, who have joined us today. And we look forward to seeing you back uh, here soon and, and hopefully at the museum uh, to see not only Paul's exhibition, uh, but also uh, Last Stress and our uh, uh, exhibition of outsider art. So um, from all of us at the museum, uh, thank you and we'll see you soon.